Tech Heart Homes. We fabricate your dreams as real. Fabricated villas, resorts, residential homes, hotels, QSR outlets, commercial places. We blend most sophisticated technology and art. Do any arms to the nature. At the same time, contribute new petals to the serenity of nature. Fabricated house should last over 100 years. And in this respect, by no means, we're so often conventionally built house. We offer completion in 100 days, 25 years of construction warranty, 30% cost reduction, 20% materials are reusable, painting with putty work, UPVC windows, branded wires and other accessories. You can dream, we can make it possible. Take heart homes. Hello, hope I'm audible. Hello, may I know if I'm audible? Yes, you are, yes, Sarah. You missed out. Okay. No man of science wants merely to know. He acquires knowledge to appease his passion for discovery. He does not discover in order to know. He knows in order to discover, and this is going to be the right platform for it. A warm good evening to all the inquisitive minds out there. It's a pleasure to have you all here for today's webinar on space exploration, conducted as a part of NOAA 3.0. Today is day five of NOAA 3.0. Our event is sponsored by Club FM and Tickard Homes. NOAA is a collaborative venture featuring space enthusiasts and communities from leading colleges of the state, which include GEC Trishu, CET Trivandrum, Mar Ephenicius College of Engineering Kodamagalam, GEC Kannu, GEC Idiki, NSS Palakkad, RIT Kottayam, TKM Kollam, Amrita School of Engineering Amritapuri. The initiative focuses on promoting space research and exploration as a bright career option and promises to off offer unparalleled opportunity to learn from industry experts, network with peers, and explore the latest developments in space technology. Now, I invite the speaker and guest of today's session, Sri Alvin P. James, a science communicator and an aspiring researcher. He did his master's in physics from NIT Calicut serve with help us gain insights on the so-called complicated computational cosmology. Now, I hand over the session to Sri Alvin. Sir, please. Thank you, Sarah. I hope I'm audible. And do, can I know, are there any non-Malus here? Like, do, need, do I need to shift to, can I shift to Malayalam or are there any non-Malus? You could just raise your hands or something. Yeah, there are. So yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, I see you guys. Okay, and I do want this to be an interactive session. So if there's anything which you find which is troubling in between, do let me know. And if I'm not audible in between, do let me know. And if that's all fine, I'll start. Like whenever I say something, it is not clear. Just let me know. I don't want to continue without. Let without you guys understanding what I'm what I'm communicating to you. Okay, fine. So as a title suggests, what I do, what I what I want to convey is to get, give you a brief understanding on what is computational cosmology. Basically, what we do in computational cosmology, as the title suggests, is basically we try to bring in the universe in a box. And I know that that doesn't make that that doesn't make any sense. And what is much more easy would be for me to show you a picture of, let's say, even if I'm speaking to you about a tiger or a, let's say even any elephant, it would be much better and much more practical to show you 
what it looks like than to tell you okay it has a very big legs or it has a very long trunk or all those things but that doesn't make any sense to you without the big picture but the question is if i am to show you a picture depicting computational cosmology do i have such a picture to show you what cosmology if i let's see if i say i'm going to talk about sun i could show you okay this is sun but if i'm going to talk about let's say the moon i could show you this is the moon i could take a picture of those and show it to you but when it comes to computational cosmology there aren't any pictures available so what do we do when we do not have something we try to make something and these days it is much much easier and easily accessible for us to uh, make pictures you just need to give it a prompt in an ai and i've generated these images using the photo ai basically i just gave something like uh, computational cosmology into to computational cosmology and these are some of the images the photo ai gave me but as you can see not even any of those pictures gives you any idea about what computational cosmology is i mean i don't understand what these pictures mean i think ai has a very good imagination and they just it just gave me something which is very vague or something so even after trying to give an idea regarding computational cosmology using a picture seems not that fruitful so we'll try to tackle the concept of computational cosmology part by part first let us understand what cosmology is then we will move into what computational cosmology is i think most of you are readily familiar with these two terms which is astronomy and astrophysics and we do these days use these terms interchangeably but there is a very proper definition on what these are astronomy is basically let's say at night you all go out you all look at the skies and if you try to understand the different positions where moon is where mars is let's say where venus is then you are successfully become an astronomer and if you start asking the question of how the moon came to be or more like what is moon or how our sun glows all those physical questions you become an astrophysicist so that is the proper when you take the terms for granted or when you take the terms for its definition that is how astronomy and astrophysics are differentiated but these days you can see that these two terms are used interchangeably and astronomy these days means astrophysics and astrophysics these days means astronomy because time has come where where, where these people who look at the stars do try to understand what those stars are made of and these days most of the astronomers have there are still amateur astronomers but the line between astronomy and astrophysics have blurred completely in this new era of astronomy and astrophysics so the question still remains how is our type how is our cosmology related to these terms these terms as we know are very familiar i hope all of you are familiar with these two terms that is where these two questions come into play let's say you're taking a shower and you start pondering about these questions how did the universe come to be how it evolves or let's say will it end we are all part of a big universe and we're not just we're not just speaking about the solar system as a whole we're speaking about all the stars all the galaxies in it and we can ponder these questions how the universe is formed how it evolves and how it is going to end there is an end hopefully there will be an end and that is where cosmology comes into play if you uh, get a more proper definition of it we can say cosmology the scientific study of large scale properties of the universe as a whole you try to understand in cosmology our smallest building block or let's say when you say it's atom when it comes to a matter and all when it comes to cosmology our smallest building block is the galaxies when it comes to a cos when for a cosmologist he, he doesn't care what galaxies are made of 
for him galaxies are the smallest fundamental parts and we try to understand how these galaxies are distributed how these galaxies came to be how these galaxies evolved and all those things so we understood in a more general scientific perspective what the term cosmology or the what the study of cosmology deals with now as i said we try to understand the universe as a whole before that we need to understand where we are in the universe they ask you to write an address you would let's say many of you would be in most of you in kerala you will write okay my home my ho house name your street name your district your state then you would say country india then you see continent then earth and there is a earth we would say is a planet in the solar system solar system is a as a stellar system in the milky way galaxy and the milky way galaxy is basically a group of galaxies called the local group and these local groups and other groups together form something called the virgo supercluster and this virgo supercluster and other superclusters together form something called the lanika supercluster and together it's all in the observable universe so when we say earth it is it's just a average planet in an average star average planet rotating around an average star in the outskirts of the milky way and i'm sure there would be some life somewhere somewhere in another planets or another star there are billions of star and the stars you see are just from the milky way galaxy there are other billions and billions of galaxies out there so i told you how the questions which we deal as a cosmologist are the questions of how universe is formed and the scientists are right right now are are in the consensus that the most accepted theory of the evolution of the universe or the, how the universe formed is something called the lambda cdm model of cosmology so what is the lambda cdm model the so lambda cdm model basically says that the universe is created by a big bang and then there was something called inflation recombination dark ages it's after these three stages that the first stars and galaxies form then if you take the current distribution of the galaxy we have something called 5% of the outer ordinary matter 27% of dark matter and 60% of dark matter i don't want you to dwell into this we we'll look into each of these terms in detail in the coming slides but i do want you to understand when you speak about cosmology when you speak about big bang this is how we believe or how the general scientific community believe universe as we see today as formed started with something called the big bang inflation recombination dark ages it's only after those dark ages we see the stars first stars forming then currently we see a universe of this particular distribution of matter and how like basically you can't just bring in the idea of the big bang model or you cannot bring in the idea of all these lambda cdm model of cosmology just from thin air you you need to have theoretical basis on which these models are built so when you speak about the foundations of cosmology it's basically between two things one is a general relativity it's basically a very advanced theory of gravity developed by einstein and which is very hard and i i wouldn't want to mince my words it's really that hard and basically you study mathematics more than physics when you deal with gt in a, as a course if you take this in the university you would study uh, let's say quarter like a half of your semester would be studying tensors and all we basically use mathematical tensors to depict the universe and we put in some other tensors to depict mass and all and we tell the universe as a whole or the space as a whole curves based on this particular theory that is what general relativity this is one of the foundations of the big bang model or let's say the lambda cdm model the other one the other foundation is basically the cosmological principle so if you take in a very local space let's say in earth if you look towards the 
sun or looks towards the star, you could say that it is not same. You could see different stars in different places. The cosmology principle says that whichever point you take in space or whichever direction you look in space, it's just the same. The cosmology principle has two ideas. One is the homogeneity of space and the isotropy of space. Even if you are standing anywhere in space, it doesn't matter. Even if you are looking any directions around you, it shouldn't matter. But this cosmological principle comes into play only in a very large scale. That's a, a 200 megaparsec. I don't want to dwell. I don't want you to dwell into those terms or those numbers. We need to understand when we speak about the cosmological principle, we're speaking about very large scales. Yes, it is not homogeneous in a very short scale. Like you wouldn't see an equal distribution of planets around, uh, around the sun. You, wouldn't, you cannot see equal number of planets if you look right or left from Earth. There is disparity. It is not homogeneously distributed. There is no isotropy. But when you look in a very extragalactic scales or in a cluster scales, you could find this homogeneity and isotropy in the universe. So the idea of cosmology or the idea of lambda stadium model is based on these two theoretical pillars. And this is how you depict the Big Bang model. Basically, I hope you can see my cursor also. At this point, there was something, see, basically, we have never seen Big Bang. OK, what we see to the maximum, how much large is needed? Rabargi, I didn't get your question, da? You told um, large scale is needed to get right. more yeah, I think at least a minimum of 200 megaparsec needs to be there. 200 megaparsecs. 200 megaparsecs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so, if you can see this image, basically, uh, this is currently, let's say this is currently where we are, 13.8 billion years into the future after the Big Bang. So, I do want to tell you that we do not, we have never seen this Big Bang. If you, if you look at the sky, what you see is the past. The sun you see is basically, I think, seven seconds or like one point some minutes old. The light which comes from the moon is a particular second old. If you look at the stars, clearly years old. So basically, the farther you look, it's basically you're looking into the past. The night sky is basically a time machine. So if you are here and if you're looking past, you can easily see older and older galaxies, older and older uh, point. And there comes a point where you won't be able to see anything. That's where the dark ages. So why is that? And if, even if you just look back, basically the, the maximum maximum background which you can see is something called the cosmic microwave background. And it is from there we have extrapolated, let's say, OK, uh, we see that every object in the sky is going away from each other. So what did the scientists say? If everything is going away from each other, in a, in a point of time in the past, it could it could have all have been at a single point. So that's how the concept of Big Bang comes. In a, in a very distant past, that is 13.8 billion years ago, everything which you see were at a single point. And there was a Big Bang of some sort, and it all just scattered from there. So here you can see this Big Bang. And there was a sudden inflation. Inflation is basically a sudden expansion. I want you to think of inflation as a sudden expansion. And then the first three minutes, there were a lot of things happened. First protons formed, then nuclear fusion begins. Then nuclear fusion ends because uh, the nuclear fusion, which happens there, is for a very small scale. Let's say hydrogen, helium, I think lithium is also formed. You cannot form this large iron or all those large uh, atoms in this initial nuclear fusion phase. Nuclear fusion is basically a two atoms coming to form. A new atom. You have two hydrogen atoms. If you merge those together, you get something called the helium atom. Similarly, after the first protons were formed, protons together formed into some helium, some protons formed into lithium. And the thing is, the universe at this time was very hot. 
and there was no light. Basically, there was no place for this light to pass on there because it's all like hot, dense, gas. And the point where the first light was emitted is what we call the micro cosmic microwave background. It was emitted, let's say, some in a very high frequency wavelength or a very high energetic light. Uh, we could say maybe some gamma rays or X rays or something. But at the moment, it has been red shifted. What happens is that when lights, light passes pass through the universe, the universe is expanding. So if it is a X-ray, when it comes to us, it has been the wavelength has been uh, extended so that it has become a microwave right now. So if you look at the sky, and if you have the old TVs with that static, you know that grains used to come when you don't have a channel or or sorts. That is what the microwave background is. So microwave background is the first light. So after the first light, you wouldn't have any light. So basically, you have some atoms there, but you don't you do not have any stars to form new light. So until the first stars form, what you have are the dark ages. So there are no light. There, there are there aren't any new light. So if you look at the sky. Before the first star, you would find a period in between where you, you cannot see anything. So what we see at night, if you look up, why is that the CMB maintained? It's a black body. OK, fine. So yeah, CMB is basically a black body spectrum of, I think, 2.7 Kelvin or something. And if you emit, uh, let's say, this cosmic microwave background has emitted a black body of a higher temperature. When it is redshifted, all the waves are redshifted. It is not that only some of the light that comes are redshifted. Whatever radiation has been emitted at that time has been equally redshifted when you when we observe it. So that is why even if the black body peaks at some point, whatever the curve is, all those points, all those light have been equally redshifted. That is why we see that. And I'll come into that why black or cosmic microwave background is relevant when we move forward. So we are under the assumption, yeah, thank you, yeah, fine. Uh, we are under the assumption that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, right? I did mention that cosmology is based on those fundamental idea of homogeneity and isotropy. So after this dark ages, we have the stars. Then after uh, the stars, some stars explode, then they form galaxies. Yeah, again, they form new stars. That's how the cycle continues. And right now, 13.8 billion years after, we are there at the current time. As I said, if you look at the universe right now, what you see is basically this five percent is of ordinary matter, and these five percent ordinary matter is basically the matter which we see around us: matter in hot intergalactic gas, warm intergalactic gas, cool intergalactic gas, and all the matter which you can see. If I would put put it into this so-called ordinary matter, then we have something called the dark energy. So basically, dark energy is not as elusive as you see in all those sci-fi series and sci-fi movies and all. What we know about dark energy is basically from Einstein's theory of relativity. When you, when you look into Einstein, energy and mass are basically the same thing. So when I say universe as a whole, 100% divided into 5% ordinary matter, 25% dark matter, 70% dark matter, this is the energy matter content. So basically, both energy and matter are taken into account when you say these percentages. So if you look at the general theory of relativity, you need to have a universe which shouldn't be accelerating at the rate it is right now. So basically, there is some gravity as the idea, gravity as the force of, let's say, it should it pulls everything closer, gravity. But what we see is that rather than pulling everything closer, there is a acceleration everything is moving apart at the accelerated rate and we could not explain that using the general theory of relativity that is where dark energy comes into play we use dark energy to explain those unaccounted energy 
with which the universe is expanding. Temperature or radiation. If I'm right, I think it's the radiation temperature. I'm not sure about it. Uh, basically, it's 2.7 Kelvin plus or minus point some, some, something is the uh, temperature of the cosmic microwave background. Those small changes is basically the small perturbations. And I'll, I'll go into those perturbations because those small changes from 2.7 Kelvin are very important when we move past all this. Okay. So basically, what we know about dark energy is basically there is something which we cannot account for in this cosmic expansion, and we call it dark energy. And that is it. Whatever you see in those sci-fi series, there, are, there aren't any scientific basis to it. It is conjectures. Maybe there are even scientific ideas or hypotheses, but what we know for sure is that there is something missing, and we call it dark energy. That is it. Similarly, it goes for dark matter also. <clears throat> Basically, what we did was that if this is the center of the Milky Way, this is the Milky Way galactic center curve, and we measured the velocity of different stars up to this point. This is the sun's speed. And after that, we basically use something called H1 alpha, I think. We use H1 uh, emissions from hydrogen there. Basically, what we do is that we try to measure the velocity from the center of the Milky Way to the outskirts of the Mil Milky Way. Velocity of with the objects are moving around the Milky Way. You do know that stun, the Earth is rotating around the Sun, and Sun is not a stationary object. Sun is rotating around the center of the Milky Way. So if that is the case, what we know from the I Newtonian Kepler theory and all, the curve should have gone like this. If you look at the mass, which you can see, this is a predicted curve. But what you see is something like this. There is a disparity. This disparity is basically what we call dark matter. Other than this, you do not know anything. I do stress this point. When you see these sci-fi shows and all, you come up with a lot of new things where they say dark matter is that, dark energy is this. But this is, these are the only things which we know for sure. There are some unaccounted mass, and we do not know what that what that mass is, and we just call it dark matter. There is something which interacts gravitationally as if there is mass, as if it has mass, but we cannot see. It's like if you take a weighing machine and suddenly there is a 10 kilo there. And if I take a let's say, if I weigh this and I if I look at it, I see it to have a 10 kilogram of mass if I look at it. But when I weigh it, I see 100 kilogram mass. There's nearly 90 kilogram of mass missing. So that is what dark matter is. We do not know what that is. We just call it dark matter because we see some mass there and we cannot, we do not see it in that. So that is the fundamentally that is only what when is the dark energy. So if I remember correctly, dark energy estimation is basically uh, dark energy estimation is basically done using type 1 supernova expansions. So what we do is that we have data of type 1. Oh, okay, we need to understand how the universe is expanding, right? So it is not easy to understand how the how fast the galaxies are moving away from us. So basically, there is something called type 1 supernova. Supernova is basically explosion of a star, and these galaxies distant galaxies, we look for these type 1 supernovas and we estimate how fast these universe, how fast these galaxies are going away from us. And we have the Einstein's equation, something of like the Friedman equation. Uh, in a very brief way, I'll explain that I told you like Einstein's gender relativity and the homogeneity and isotropy forms the basis of cosmology. So basically what you do is that you take this idea of homogeneity and isotropy you take gender relativity and you put this homogeneity and isotropy into the Einstein's equations. And you get something called the Friedman's equation. And this Friedman's equations govern all this. So what you do is that we put in this expansion rate into this Friedman equation and we see it is not matching up. And those amount which is not matching up, we call it dark energy. That is how we get this percentage. I think it's fine. 
okay so currently uh, right now i spoke about what cosmologies or more thoroughly what cosmologies deals with then we spoke about the current idea or current model of cosmology which most of the scientific community believes in now i said basically there's something about dark matter if you take a galaxy i mean if you take a milky way all these galaxies are engulfed in something called the dark matter halo so whatever galaxies you take they they it all has a dark matter halo surrounding it and it is said that most of the galaxies can only be formed in the potential wells or let's say in more simple terms uh, let's say we have a lot of dark matter and these dark matters comes together because of gravity and form something like a something like a uh, globe or something exactly basically this dark energy or dark matter is basically just to match the equations that is what we do if there is something we cannot uh, match the equations with the observation we observe something and we try to explain this observation with the equation and whenever we see that okay the observation is not matching with the equation you put in new things that is what that is that is basically what dark matter that is basically dark energy there's nothing more we believe our our theory or our idea of the gravity is right and so as to make our theory of gravity right whenever we find discrepancies between the observation and the theory we put in new things and we call it dark matter and dark energy that is fundamentally it yeah i know you all find it skeptic but that's what cosmology does so what i'm trying to say is that we have dark matter particles and we believe they do we only interact with gravity so these dark matter particles clump together to form uh for that i'm basically it's not about statistical significance it's more about let's say uh when when we speak about this galaxy rotation curves we do know that at let's say 35 kilo parsecs we do know that uh, the velocity which we observe there is of the order of 200 km per second but if you look at the mass you can only find the velocity if you look at the mass and calculate using that mass you would only see a velocity you you should only see a velocity of 100 km per second there is a difference of nearly 100 km per second so whatever that difference you add in extra mass so that this extra so that that difference is made made up difference is that difference is tallied out so that is what how these schemes into play i think that's clear so what i was speaking about is that we have this dark matter particles which only interact with uh, gravity they clump together to form dark matter halos and what we believe is that in these dark matter halos which only interact with gravity these galaxies form so in this dark matter halos we let's say we have some visible matter and this visible matter visible matter let's say some protons and all these go into this uh, dark matter halos and inside this dark matter halo we get the formation of galaxies at all so i did say that the idea of cosmology we believe the universe is homogeneous and isotropic if we have a universe which is homogeneous and isotropic how do the structures form as i said if you look around us you can see galaxies you can see all sort of inhomogeneous structures galaxies planets stars and all those things but our fundamental idea when it comes to cosmology is the idea of an homogeneous universe so to tackle these questions we bring in something called perturbations remember the cosmic microwave background i told you uh, if it was a very well distributed it should all have been 2.7 kelvin but you can find small changes or small discrepancies between the temperatures at different point is caused by microwave background and it's a order of let's say 10 plus or minus point something something kelvin that small changes are the perturbations 
He believed these perturbations are due to quantum fluctuations during the inflation. So basically, some uh, uh, big bang happened during that, and there are some quantum fluctuations. And these quantum fluctuations evolved. For initially, they evolved for something called the baryonic acoustic oscillations. I don't want to delve into that. Basically, in a very homogeneous and isotropic universe, there were small changes in the in the homogeneity that grew into what we call the galaxies and all those. Yeah. This you see, so what you, 0.0013 Kelvin. It's a very small per small difference. Those small differences or, or those small perturbations is what we see as galaxies and other large scale structures here. So we do have equations to these problems. But how do we, it's called the perturbation equations, cosmological perturbation equations and all. The problem is it is not easy for us to solve these equations. So we came up with the idea of cosmology. We came up with an idea of cosmological uh, model of cosmology. We came up with the idea of how we can incorporate inhomogeneous bodies into this model. And we say, OK, this galaxies and all are formed due to perturbations. And we make equations to define these perturbations. Then we come to the next big problem. That is, we, can, we are not able to solve these equations. We can only solve these equations for very tiny density differences. Density differences in the sense, I told you it is very homogeneous and it is very small changes would come in density. For small changes, we can, but and that too for the highly symmetric cases, are we able to solve these equations? So, what do we do when we are not able to solve these equations? That is where computational cosmology comes into play. So, scientists have made some equations and we are not able to solve it, and we find a new method to deal with it. And that is computational cosmology. In a more genuine sense, it is the modeling of the structure formation in the universe by means of numerical simulations. I get into this very easily. So basically, this come this come that's cosmological simulations. We only deal with dark matter particles. Remember, I told you dark matter particles clump together to form dark matter halos. And most of the galaxies which we see are inside these dark matter halos. If you take a normal matter, they interact not just with gravity, they interact with, let's say, electromagnetic forces. There is strong interaction, there is weak interaction. But when you take dark matter particles, they only interact with gravity. So when you, when you are to do simulation, you only need, need to take into account the gravity between these particles. So I give, imagine all these chairs are, let imagine this was an offline setup and you're all sitting in front of me in a big hall and you were randomly in a very homogeneous, in isotropically distributed in the classroom. And when it comes to these simulations, we devise these homogeneous initial conditions from the cosmic micro background and all. And what happens is that, let's say this guy uh, starts forming groups and he will, he will ask this guy to be part of his group. He will ask this guy to be part of the group. He will ask this guy to be part of his group. And these process of asking the nearby, uh, nearby students or nearby person sitting near him is what we call gravity. So basically, what happens is that we run the simulation. And when the gravity, we try to understand how the gravity acts between each, each particles, they start, when the time is time processes, they start to clump together. So we have a lot of different, different, different things. And they are clumped together. And we see different, many clumps of dark matter particles. So how do we understand? What all clumps are there? There is something called halo finding algorithms. So these steps are purely computational. Basically, you take a computer, you take, you write a code, and you put in the memory some particles, and you predefine where the particles are. Then you say these particles have so and so mass. Then you uh, put in the equations of gravity, explaining 
how these particles interact with mass and you forward it in time and they start clumping together and then you need to understand which are you need to it's a computer simulation so you need, you can't just see and look so you put in uh, codes to understand which where all are these clumps of dark matter and we you run those algorithms and we clump them to them we call this dark matter halos so what we did here is in a computer we have simulated dark matter particles coming together to form dark matter halos we have set up the initial condition we compute the force between the particles we move the particles step by step based on the force based on the gravitational force then we repeat this second and third step until the time is we need and we run halo finding to find these halos we have many halo finding algorithms it's something called friends of friends spherical over density combi so den max bound density maxima so are basically algorithms or computer codes to understand which all particles are together that's all nothing more then there are many cosmological simulations like abacus submit is a 2021 one of the latest simulations and i, I work using abacus submit simulation data and some of the pigeon day simulation in 2020 abacus cosmos in 2018 basically you cannot do these simulations in a normal computer you need to have a super computer to do the simulation basically many people have run different codes in different different super computers and they have saved the output of the data and we call those are the different simulations so until now we understood what cosmology is we understood how or at least i think you understand how in a homogeneous and isotropic cosmology we can form structures and we finally saw how because we are not able to solve these equations of perturbations we are able to simulate these for simulate the formation or let's say to simulate the process so as to see the formation of structures why do we do this and how do we know we are right let's say we are simulating this uh let's say we are simulating this for a let's say we are simulating this for a a cubical box our universe is not cubical and let's say in the computer we are simulating it for a let's say a 100 megaparsec or 2000 megaparsec megaparsec is a is a um, unit of distance the very large unit of distance you should google it for the no more and we have simulated and we have made these dark matter halos in a box in a computer how are we to compare this with the universe so what do we do let's say i have two classes we have 10a and 10b two divisions of a class and i want to compare whether class a is performing well in exam compared to class b we never compare the roll number 1 to roll number 2 or roll number 2 to roll number 3 there may be only uh, 10 roll 10 students in class a and 50 students in class b what do you do you come up with statistics maybe you would find some average mark or you would say some mean all those things similarly we come up with something called the statistical properties of dark matter halos so from these simulations we define something called the halo mass function and the counting cell simulations counting cell distribution these are in simple terms basically like a density and the other one is basically counting the numbers i'll briefly dwell into what these are these are the things which i'm working on currently currently this is thing which i did work during my masters thesis and which i currently working on <clears throat> so what i did is basically i have taken the abacus submit simulation basically it's a highly accurate cosmological simulation it's run in the uh, abacus submit supercomputer in some place in oklaridge national laboratory and there they use something called the friends of friends and spherical over density algorithms uh child we call the combi s algorithm to find the dark matter halos so i don't want you to dwell much into this equation i want you to understand halo mass function as the number of dark matter halos divided by the volume and uh, what we do is that we bin the <clears throat> let's say uh, 0 to 10 mass 
how many dark matter halos are there we put in one bin then we count 10 to 20 how many dark matter halos are there we put in another bin that number divided by the volume of our simulation into the distance we have put 10 right 0 to 10 that 10 that is this lamp delta the change in that bin this is basically density as per volume here is a number density number per volume and it's in log and dot that is when, it, when you take it in a more academic perspective you will look at log and all but you want just to understand what that is it is basically number density number per unit volume it's a five dark matter halos per meter cube that is it and this is something which I this is something which we get if you are to compute the halo mass function. It's not relevant. And this is I just wanted to show what that is. Similarly, there's something called the count in cells distribution. So what count in cell distribution does is that I wanted to look around the room which you're sitting. So I hope every one of you are sitting in a cuboidal room. I'm, I'm sure none of you have a spherical room or anything. In a cuboidal room, if I am to divide this room into small, small, small cuboids, and I'm going to ask the question of <clears throat> how many, and let's say in your cuboidal room, uh, you have a lot of hydrogen balloons floating around all over your room. And I'm going to divide the room into multiple small, small cuboidal boxes. And I'm going to ask the question of how many cuboidal cuboids, or how many of those cells have zero hydrogen balloons. I would ask the question of how many of those cells have 10 hydrogen balloons, 100 hydrogen balloons. That is basically what counting cells is. This is the number of halos in a box and the frequency. I We have normalized it to make it frequency, but you need to understand what counting cells is. Counting cells is basically that number. That's it. Let's say if you have 100 hydrogen balloons, how many, how many boxes have 100 hydrogen balloons? We just divide it by the total boxes to get this uh, frequency. No, uh, this is not a Poisson distribution. If you can see, uh, I have only shown it for a particular mass bins. I think it is for 1000 mass bins and all. This changes. And it is properly modeled by something called the gravitational quasi equilibrium distribution. And it is basically derived from the thermodynamic models you consider these galaxies as something called gases and you uh, basically there is another distribution by considering these galaxies gases and putting in gravitational clustering and all that is what it fits in my study i could see that this changes from poisson to gaussian at a at a lower ma mass ranges and all you could see a different distribution i haven't put it put that here just a one of those distribution you can see that so this liquidity distribution as a speciality that this changes from this uh, Poisson to Gaussian depending on the number of number of cuboids I increase. So GQD is the most proper distribution. It's, a, it's I've seen that this GQD changing from Poisson to Gaussian at times. So uh, what is relevant is not the distribution. What is relevant is how or what count in cells is. So I spoke about two of those statistical properties of dark matters. Again, the question remains, how does it really look like? How do, if we are to calculate these from the galaxies which we see around, and I knew I do want to take you to the point that these statistics are calculated from dark matter halo simulations. When we observe, we are not observing dark matter halos, we are observing galaxies so but we do have an idea or we do have the theory of galaxy formation that most of the galaxies are inside a dark matter halo so similarly we will be able to find these counting cells distribution from the galaxies and we can compare the counting cells from observations and for that we have some redshift redshift surveys and I think a Euclid, a new another survey is going to be launched this year by European Space Agency and all. So when we take these redshift surveys, we take in these galaxy data and we found we find counting cells using that data and we compare it with our simulations and we can understand that our theory is right. This is how we check whether our theory of cosmology is right. 
to the observations. And that is it. We can derive the same statistics from galaxy surveys and we compare, and if they match, we know our theory is right. This is what computational cosmology does. And if you want to look into the codes of like, I do I don't want to mince my words, like it's very really hard to do this. Like uh, when you see the output, it is very nice. If you want to look in the code, uh, the it's a basically a very computational program prob computational problem to be dealt with. If you want to look at the statistical property code, you can see look at my GitHub account. You free to go through the codes lot. And thank you. I think that's it. Any questions? Hello. Hello, sir. Oh, yeah. Hello, sir. Thank you for the talk. Um, I am interested in learning computation simulations, but I don't hmm. know what concepts I should start with. I'm a master's oh. student, so oh. um, what mathematical or comp uh, you know coding concepts should I start with to get into this thing? Mm, yeah. Basically, uh, uh, are you looking to do it preferably in like cosmology itself or looking? See, these simulations are useful in most of the places. There is something called hydrodynamic simulations. Simulations are useful when it comes to mechanics. So are you looking into let's say like astrophysics or cosmology in particular or in general? Um yeah, astrophysics itself, because I was about to get started with a project where I'm trying to simulate a simple black hole kind of thing. And oh. so now how should I yeah. go about it in a regular laptop? I don't have access to supercomputer or something. Ah uh, yeah, that so, is another problem. In a regular laptop, there's something called numerical cosmology, a numerical GTR, Chelsea the relativity. I think when you're simulating these cost, uh, black holes and all, we need to look into that. But what I work on is basically n body simulations. And if you email me or message me, I'll be I'll share you those materials which I have. And those are regarding computational cosmology. Okay, these are not regarding those hydrodynamic simulations. Because if you are to simulate the sun, you need something called hydrodynamic simulations. Because there is plasma, so all those other things come into play. If you are to simulate some other GTR, there's something called numerical cosmos, numerical GTR, that's some other thing. So we cannot compare all the simulations. And basically, it's all uh, solving equations, if you ask me. Yeah, that's it. OK, thank you. Uh, one more question. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have seen your profile as a, you are a like, very popular science communicator. So how do you start uh, becoming a science com com communicator? What do you actually, uh, uh, oh, so how do you apply or something? No, 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 no. Basically, from a very young age, I used to there are a lot of science or societies in Kerala. There's, there's Breakthrough Science Society, there's Astro Kerala, there are all those different science societies in Kerala, in Kerala, that is. So I started as a young student in my school days. I used to attend these, attend these all these sessions. And after my master's, I come to a point where I'm able to take these sessions. I do have a very, very general background in astrophysics and Cosmology and general theory of relativity have taken courses in all those. And if we're able to communicate to the public these terms in a very simple way, without any jargon, without any uh, mumbo jumbo, you are a science communicator. That's it. And opportunities is so basically, I started, I think, I started by taking classes for uh, after my master's. I started during the World Space Week time for school students. And I, I then I took a class session for. Uh, I think an Astro's monthly lecture, Astro Kerala monthly lecture. Then I then one of my friends saw the lecture and they invited me to take a class in uh, the in one of the engineering college. So that's how you grow. Basically, if people see your talk and sees they find it interesting, they contact you to take new sessions. That's how you become a science communicator. And uh, this is my first online talk to be fair. Like I'm not comfortable in an online session because if an offline session, I'll be able to see your faces. Are you understanding? Do I need to slow down my pace? Do I need to explain it in another way? So that is not there in an online interaction. So basically, that's how you do it. I hope that's clear. Yeah. Um, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Homogeneous up to the order of 200. It's not P mega parsecs. Not parsecs, mega parsecs. It's nice of fluctuation in the. <coughs> 
uh, age of the universe is calculated no i don't remember how the age of the universe is calculated but regarding the fluctuations it is those fluctuations which we see as these galaxies and local group of galaxies and all and those fluctuations have grown to be smaller than 200 megaparsec scales even if you i told you like 2.7 kelvin plus or minus 00, 00 i think vargis has mentioned it's 0.00013 kelvin uncertainty it's very small and those small units is very big compared to this 2 megaparsec so if you go above those 200 megaparsec you would see a very well distributed structure in any direction you look or any position you take so if you go inside that 200 megaparsec you will see small small galaxies clusters planets stars and all it's those small galaxies and clusters that have been, that formed from these initial perturbations that's how it is Are there any other yeah. Sir, I have a question. I don't know if it's a full question. Yeah, no, or ask, not. Ask. Um, how can man hmm. how can you actually say that this dark matter is actually a matter? Uh, is it from the static analysis? Oh, or so else? basically, uh, as I've shown you, basically what we have measured is the velocity. <laughs> What, what we have measured is the velocity. And let's say I am trying, I am taking this. And I know if I look at it, it is supposed to have 10 kilograms. I am taking a weighing machine and weighing this. And when I look at the reading, I see 100 kilograms. So there is a discrepancy of like 90 kilograms. So we call, we think it is 90 kilograms of matter. Because we are weighing it, something which has mass is there. Something which interacts gravitationally, it is there. So that difference is basically ma mass or matter. We call it dark matter. That is what dark matter is. Is it clear? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> Just no more questions. We'll wind up. Inshija, did I? Organizers. I hope anyone has anything to ask. You can, ask, you can ask me any questions. Like it's fine, not just cosmology, astrophysics in general. Physics in general, I wouldn't say, but still, I'd be able to answer. If I if I do know, I'll be able to share what I do know. No questions. But can you say oh, some ask. books about this? Uh, you want to understand? See, what is your background right now? Master student, right? No, I'm a BSc third year student. BSc third year, right? Yes, BSc sir. physics. Yes, BSc physics. Oh, fine. Then there's something called a cosmology from a Lidl. You need to understand modern cosmology by Lidl, L I D D L A. And the use, the peculiarity of this book is that it doesn't use. VPR to explain the idea of cosmology. If you know plus one plus two, uh, Einstein's theory of uh, Einstein or plus one plus two Newton's theory of gravity, you'll be able to follow this book. And they just it explains how this cosmology basically explains cosmology. So if you if you are if you are looking into computational cosmology, you need to understand cosmology. I would suggest you start with that. My guide, Dr. Charles, uh, started me with with that. So I would also suggest this. Any other question? Any general questions regarding astrophysics, cosmology? Completely fine. And even if you, you can also speak in Malayalam, okay, right? Like session carrying a park, general at English and Korea, Malayalam, Parai. Where some share park will be. With the registration form, we have a question. Mm, oh, fine. Asking yeah. any doubts, mm. okay. Uh, can we read out that? Sure, sure, sure. <coughs> I'll coordinate. We can read out some questions. Okay. Yeah.
हेलो हेलो सर या आई एम आई ऑडिबल या शर्ट शर्ट ओके ए क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम द फॉर्म्स दैट वी कलेक्टेड इस दैट व्हाट इस द रोल ऑफ डार्क मैटर इन एवोल्यूशन ऑफ आवर यूनिवर्स रोल ऑफ डार्क मैटर इन एवोल्यूशन ओके बेसिकली एस आई टोल्ड यू दिस गैलेक्सीज फॉर्म इन दिस डार्क मैटर वेल्स so when you see the evolution of the universe this dark matter dark energy and all are intertwined can't just take one out and say no 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 so basically if you look at it look at it as a whole this dark matter i say said is plays a very big role as per our current understanding of this theory and all as per our current understood model these galaxies form form galaxies are formed inside a dark matter well so that is the role these play and i do want to stress the fact that if someone comes up with a new theory which can explain all these observations without any dark matter or dark energy then dark matter and dark energy will cease to exist this dark matter and dark energy are not based on some observation which we see it's purely based on the fact that we cannot find something and we call it dark matter there are certain theories and we call mod modified newtonian dynamics and all mond trying to explain without dark matter so i do i do want you to some take away is that is dark matter and dark energy are basically a theoretical concept or theoretical idea put in such that our equations balance, balance. Uh, baryon asymmetry in the sense are you speaking about the dark matter like uh, antimatter matter asymmetry that's baryon asymmetry right yeah it's a matter any matter asymmetry problem oh so yeah uh, the fact is we, i what i think is we do not know for sure whether i think there are many theories i am not i'm not read into that in a very academic perspective but i do understand is that in the initial universe there are to be equal amount of antimatter and matter but if you are to look around you wouldn't see any antimatter all the all the matter around us is formed using regular matter so the question is why how did this regular matter came to dominate and i think it's still a contested question and i'm not sure regarding any solutions to that and yeah that's it i'm not that's not something i'm working on i don't want to, i'm not sure regarding that that's it okay. any other questions sir another question is saying that what are the challenges in simulating turbulent astrophysical phenomena yeah okay uh, see as i told you when it comes to astrophysical phenomena you need to take into account fluid mechanics and all those other things we call it hydrodynamic simulations that those are the simulations which we talk about when you talk about the simulations of sun and earth those are all very complicated simulations solving complicated equations some would take a supercomputer and you you need to have a very fundamental idea of the working of these equations these differential equations in order to know how to solve these in a computer using numerical simulations and it and a high level of computational skills also comes into play you need to take into account the amount of memory you have the amount of computational power you have so all those things comes into play when you are looking at it so th those are the challenges and when you speak about uh, challenges as in data as a whole new new missions be it the james webb tele james webb mission or something like the euclid mission would be bring would be bringing us terabytes and petabytes of data it is not possible for a human being to manually access and process those data you would require highly sophisticated codes to nowadays i'm sure ai would take some of the burden but you still need to write a code for the ai you can't just say ai will ai will do it you need to write a code for the ai so nowadays when it comes to astrophysics it's basically inter mission of a high level computer science high performance computing engineering and high level physics so even if you are a btech computer science students you have you can easily take a masters like phd in 
computational astrophysics and cosmology because most of the questions I see are asking for students either from a master's physics background or a beta computer science background. Because nowadays it has become a very, what do you say, a part which cannot be taken apart. It has to be the computer science, very integral part of astrophysics and cosmology as it is. Are there any other questions? Okay, sir, I think we can wind up after this question. Sure. How do scientists validate simul simulation results and ensure that they accurately represent a physical reality? Yeah, I told you. Like, when it comes to cosmological simulation, from the simulation, we take something called the statistical properties. And similarly, from observations, we compute these statistical properties. And if those statistical properties match, we say our simulation or the theory matches our observation. That is how we compare simulation and observation. And I hope that is it. And feel free to contact me if you have any doubt, email me, message me, doesn't matter. So thank you. You mind it, right? Okay, sir. Uh, thank Hello, you. sir. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, before that, uh, I'll, uh, I'll be commenting the feedback feedback form in the comment box. Okay, everyone should fill that in order to get your certificate. So make sure to fill it. I will be sharing it in the uh, WhatsApp group too. Okay. Okay, Sarah. Now you may conclude the session. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir. The session is quite beneficial. Uh, from the beginning. Uh, in fact, starting from the minute facts, you gave us a simplified version of the concept of universe and cosmology, and it was really new to me. Uh, you, you also gave your own experiences, uh, which are quite going to be quite valuable for passionate individuals who wish to pursue research in this field. So thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to thank our event coordinators for organizing this session. Uh, just as importantly, I would like to thank the participants of this session. It was wonderful to have you all here. Lastly, let me remind you all about the conclusive day of NOVA 3.0, which is set to be held in person on April 1st at GEC Trishu. Mark your calendars and join us in person at Trishu, Brownman Engineering College. Immerse yourself in an unparalleled experience that you won't find anywhere else. With this, we come to an end of the session. Thank you all. Now, I do want to add a footnote to this. Uh, I don't want you to jump into cosmology or I don't want to jump into all this just for the beauty of it. I, I understand it's very beautiful. I understand it's very fascinating. But when it comes to the nit and grit of all this, and it comes to the academic perspective, it's very challenging. And it is very, I would say, mathematical than more computational perspective. If you take cosmology, if you take astrophysics, it's very highly mathematical subject. So I do want you to keep in mind. From a, from a very personal experience, I do want to say that also. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir.